nine months after the Tigray War's conclusion, Ethiopia plunged into another conflict, this time targeting the Amhara people, the nation's second largest ethnic group. A devastating war waged by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and his ruling Oromo Prosperity Party against the country's Amhara region. In a stunning turn of events in August 2023, a member of Abiy Ahmed's Oromo Prosperity Party made an alarming public call for an alliance between the Oromo and Tigray ethnic groups, with the explicit aim of launching a military campaign against the Amhara community. Abiy Ahmed, a public call to form a united front with another ethnic group against a third, especially given his role as a leader for all, is difficult to comprehend. This development underscores deep concerns about the Nobel laureate's leadership and mental state, raising profound questions about his decision-making, moral accountability, and suitability for office. What exacerbates the disconcerting nature of this episode is its timing, occurring just nine months after Ethiopia endured a devastating conflict in the Tigray region, resulting in numerous shattered lives and a nation scarred by trauma. What is suspected to have been a drone uh, targeted the town on Sunday morning. Local medic After fighting between the army and rebels known as Fano, rights groups say ethnic Amharas are being targeted in the mass arrests. Ethiopia has plunged into a state of political crisis. This has the government declared a six-month emergency in second largest region of Amhara on Friday. Fano militiamen then seized the holy town of Lalibela which is home to a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Israeli citizens fight and die for their birthplace. This was Ayish Eshem Yohannes. As the years went on, he saw what was happening in Ethiopia and saw that the nation was suffering. He couldn't stay out anymore. Ayish Eshem was a soldier and then a police officer in Israel. Abi Ahmed and the TPLF forged a historic peace deal in Pretoria following one of the deadliest 21-century conflicts, resulting in millions of lives lost and an economic toll of $28 billion. This peace treaty was marred by two significant shortcomings. It failed to establish accountability for the crimes committed, and it excluded the Amhara people, who were directly affected and endured significant hardships from the negotiation process. Tragically, this treaty has become a protective shield for individuals responsible for the conflict, allowing them to evade the consequences of their actions. Even more disheartening is the fact that, rather than affording the essential time for healing and recovery that a post-conflict society so desperately needs, the key players in these conflicts have opted to celebrate each other's actions on television screens as if they were extraordinary achievements. Their shocking lack of remorse and complete disregard for human dignity has been prominently showcased. They have essentially whitewashed the entire situation, leaving the public in a state of horror. There has been no accountability for the loss of millions of lives and the staggering $30 billion cost. Glaring absence of accountability, coupled with indifference to profound suffering and a disregard for our shared humanity, set the stage for the current conflict in the Amhara region. global arena, a significant oversight is evident, and it is a shared blind spot among the international community, journalists, scholars, and analysts alike. This oversight pertains to intentional neglect 
of the TPLF's 27-year authoritarian rule. Western media and purported analyses typically commence their narratives from November 2020, marking the start of the Tigray conflict, thus largely ignoring the extensive history and repercussions of the TPLF's three decades long rule. From 1991 to 2018, the TPLF carried out a series of crimes against the Amhara community, including systematic marginalization, ethnic cleansing, severe human rights violations, atrocities, and the forceful occupation of historically Amhara territories. In November 2020, the TPLF launched attacks on the Northern Command and various towns in the Amhara region using long-range missiles. They also made explicit threats to target the Grand Nile. In the subsequent months, the TPLF further advanced into Amhara territories, carrying out multiple atrocities and war crimes, all the while inflicting substantial damage on critical infrastructure. During this tumultuous period, the Amhara community, guided by their strong belief in the concept of nationhood, transcended the suffering they had endured under Abiy's rule and united to defend Ethiopia. Civilian groups like Fano and the Amhara Special Forces played an indispensable role in preventing the TPLF from advancing towards Addis Ababa. It's essential to recognize that Ethiopia's current state owes much to their heroic action. The potential outcomes had the TPLF and OLF captured Addis Ababa could have been catastrophic, putting Ethiopia's very existence at risk. The extent of devastation that vengeful TPLF fighters might have inflicted on the capital, intentionally dismantling the nation, is almost unimaginable. The international community and Western media outlets often struggle to provide a comprehensive understanding of Fano's role. They tend to portray Fano as mere collaborators with Abi, without delving into the deeper context of their involvement or the historical backdrop of the TPLF's 27-year rule. Villages full of dead bodies. That's how one area in western Ethiopia was described following a massacre that... In Abiy's Ethiopia, a deeply unsettling historical milestone has unfolded. Mass burials of human bodies using tractor. Killings of Amhara people who are being slaughtered in their homes, in their streets, uh, even in their churches and mosques, for no reason at all other than their Amhara ethnicity. Over the past half century, the Amhara community has tragically suffered through a continuous cycle of ethnic cleansing and mass atrocities that could be characterized as genocide. These events have been characterized by gruesome killings, kidnappings, the desecration of sacred churches and mosques, and the widespread destruction of Amhara-owned properties and businesses, primarily within the region of Aromia, with a notable escalation occurring after Abiy assumed power in 2018. In the realm of Oromo politics, there is a troubling history of Oromo political elites and political parties consistently seeking opportunities to impose immeasurable suffering upon the Amhara community. Since Abiy assumed power in 2018, there has been a disturbing rise in attacks on Amhara civilians in Oromia. These Amhara farmers, 
have tragically endured an unrelenting cycle of horrifying and gruesome atrocities, with both the Aromia Regional Government and the Aromo Liberation Army being implicated. These events have inflicted enduring trauma, leaving millions of displaced survivors deeply scarred. They were being attacked just because they are Amharas. Oromo political elite and leadership never missed an opportunity to inflict lasting trauma on Amhara civilians. More than 200 people have reportedly been killed in Ethiopia in an attack in the Oromia region. Prominent extremists, Oromo nationalists from academia and the media joined in calling for revenge, killing and ethnic cleansing. Human Rights Watch, for example, has said dozens of ethnic Amhara journalists were held one of the deadliest mass killings in the East African nation. Most of the dead are of the Amhamra people. The On Sunday, more than 200 people were killed in Oromia. They were mostly from the Amhara ethnic community. In Ethiopia, the conflicts continue, ethnic conflicts. The violence has, in fact, escalated in many places. Ethiopia has one of the largest internally displaced populations in the world. 1.6 million people internally displaced, fleeing violence. That's a pretty massive failure on your government's part, is it not? In 2019, sparked by a contentious Facebook post by Jawa and the tragic assassination of Hachalu in 2020, baseless accusations were hurled at the Amhara community. The result? The horrific and unjustifiable slaughter of innocent Amhara civilians throughout Oromia, including expectant mothers. Oromo media outlets, particularly the Minnesota-based Media OMN owned by Jawa, have faced accusations of heightening ethnic tensions by spreading irresponsible and intentionally false information with a specific focus on targeting Amhara community, Amhara business figures, prominent Amharas and Amhara individuals employed in the federal government. In the last five years, in a resounding chorus, Amhara voices, ranging from parliamentarians to everyday civilians, diaspora members, activists, academics, and journalists have relentlessly implored Abi to address and confront the recurring Amhara atrocities and shield civilians. Sadly, his responses have carved a disheartening pattern, evading responsibility, belittling the seriousness of the situation, and, alarmingly, drawing inappropriate parallels like comparing it to U.S. gun violence. During a parliamentary session, when asked about civilian atrocities in Oromia and the need for protection, Abi responded, Don't listen to those who say we shouldn't plant trees while people are dying. We should plant trees. At least the deceased will have shade. We can't deploy the army to protect every village. With a population of 100 million, having 100,000 troops shouldn't be surprising. In the last six months in Los Angeles County, 224 people died. Philadelphia had 245 deaths. D.C. had 104, New York 197, and Chicago 300 deaths. Overall, in the last six months, thousands have died in America. In Addis Ababa has large of number of Oromo haters. They hate Oromo, but they want to live in Ethiopia. His response, characterized by indifference and a stark absence of empathy, was profoundly shocking in light of the atrocities committed against innocent civilians, including pregnant women suffered gruesome deaths. Instead of offering condolences and solace, his remarks were steeped in contempt and heartlessness, further deepening the pain and anguish of Amharas. These responses have fueled suspicions within the Amhara community, raising questions about Abi's possible complicity in these horrifying acts. His apparent indifference towards human life has left people profoundly puzzled. Responsibility for these unimaginable atrocities squarely rests on Abi Ahmed, accused of neglecting his duty to uphold the rule of law and turning a blind eye to these horrific events. The parliamentarian from Abi's party in the Oromia branch publicly accused members of his own party within the Oromo regional government of involvement in atrocities. However, no one has been held accountable 
and there have been no investigations into these allegations. Abiy's inflammatory and hate-filled public speeches targeting Amharas and residents of Addis Ababa have undeniably fueled further tensions and divisions. We have an extremely urgent matter that requires Parliament's attention. Could you please spare a minute? You are not allowed to talk. Amhara representatives were prevented from expressing their concerns about atrocities against civilians, with the House Speaker appointed by Abiy suppressing their voices. After five years of patience, Amharas felt compelled to resort to armed struggle as they saw no other recourse. Over the course of the TPLF's 27-year rule, the Amhara region experienced a pronounced period of neglect and underdevelopment. Unfortunately, even after Abiy Ahmed assumed the helm of leadership, the region continued to receive limited attention and support. Adding to the mounting challenges, a significant influx of displaced Amharas from Oromia sought refuge in the Amhara region, placing additional strain on its already stretched resources. In the aftermath of the devastating war initiated by the TPLF, which left towns in ruins and critical infrastructures in shambles, including hospitals, bridges, power stations, and schools across the Amhara region, the response from Abiy's government has left local residents profoundly disheartened. Pleas for assistance from the beleaguered region seem to have fallen on deaf ears, exacerbating the feelings of anger and frustration among the population. What compounds this frustration is the stark contrast between the urgent needs of the Amhara region and the priorities of Abiy's administration. Rather than channeling substantial efforts to alleviate poverty and enhance the well-being of the population, the government has chosen to allocate resources to grandiose, large-scale projects. These initiatives encompass the development of parks, resorts, parking facilities, and attention-grabbing architectural endeavors, most notably the construction of a $15 billion palace and the establishment of an entirely new city in Oromia. The conspicuous mismatch between the dire needs of the Amhara region and the allocation of resources towards ambitious and often ostentatious projects has fueled disillusionment and resentment. It underscores a pressing concern about the equitable distribution of resources and the prioritization of urgent humanitarian and infrastructural needs. Abiy Ahmed's government displayed minimal, if any, initiative in the efforts to rescue the 18 Amhara students who were enrolled at a university in the Aromia region and have been missing for over three years. The Amhara towns bordering Aromia have endured persistent destruction, and there has been a perception that the Oromo regional government either participated in or turned a blind eye to these incidents. This has added to the despair and lack of hope for their recovery. It is a widely documented fact that ethnic Amharas from the Amhara region have been subjected to entry restrictions in the capital city based on their identification. This marks an unprecedented occurrence in Ethiopian history. Apart from its political ramifications, these measures have resulted in significant disruptions and hardships. Many Amharas, including patients with critical medical appointments and travelers with international flights, have faced adverse consequences. It has become customary for Amharas to endure up to four days of waiting before being granted entry to the city.
1990, this video was aired on national television, just a year before the TPLF assumed power. During that time, two senior members of the TPLF made a consequential choice to disassociate themselves from the TPLF and turn themselves over to the government. In their televised statement, they issued a dire warning to the Ethiopian people, cautioning that if the TPLF were to come to power, it might annex historical Amhara lands. Their prediction proved accurate, as the TPLF maintained control over these lands for 27 years, finally relinquishing them in the year 2020. In 2020, Amhara lands that had been forcefully taken by the TPLF were rightfully returned to the Amharas, marking the establishment of local Amhara administrations. Abiy Ahmed initially asserted that these disputed regions rightfully belong to the Amharas, resulting in their transfer to Amhara control. In significant and surprising policy reversal, Abiy Ahmed has now decided to give control of these Amhara lands to Tigray, planting the seeds for another cycle of violence in the years to come. AB's administration, rather than fostering reconciliation and unity, appears to be employing a divisive strategy reminiscent of colonial rulers, pitting one ethnic group against another, perpetuating a distressing cycle of violence and bloodshed. Under the banner of progress, a disheartening phenomenon is unfolding in the heart of Addis Ababa, where numerous historical sites, often marked as Amhara heritage, face the dire prospect of vanishing into oblivion through relentless demolition. Urban planning, when undertaken with wisdom and foresight, should be a guardian of Ethiopia's past, prioritizing the conservation of historical sites and cultural heritage. This regrettable trend erases not only the architectural marvels of the past, but also a significant part of Ethiopia's historical narrative, a narrative that belongs to every Ethiopian, transcending ethnic boundaries and contributing to our shared cultural and historical legacy. In the complex arena of global diplomacy, Addis Ababa currently holds the prestigious fourth position. Yet beneath the surface of this international recognition lies a city grappling with a host of intricate challenges. Approximately 80% of the city's population does not belong to the Oromo ethnic group. However, recent developments in the city's governance have raised concerns about favoritism, corruption, and a departure from democratic principles. One of the most glaring issues has been the appointment of an Oromo mayor by Abiy Ahmed, who notably lacks a native connection to Addis Ababa. This decision has given rise to allegations of favoritism and nepotism, raising questions about equitable representation and the principles that should underpin governance in a multi-ethnic society. Equally concerning is the widespread placement of unelected officials from the Oromo ethnic group into key positions within various city and local administrations. This practice runs counter to democratic norms and further exacerbates concerns about equitable representation in the city's leadership. In a city where Amharic is the mother tongue for more than 80% of the population and serves as the primary language for daily communication, the compulsory introduction of the Oromo regional anthem and the mandate for students to raise the Oromia flag each morning have added fuel to the fire. These actions have intensified tensions and raised questions about cultural inclusivity and respect for linguistic diversity. They seem incongruous with the expectations of the 21st century and have drawn unfortunate parallels to the colonial era and apartheid-era South Africa. In a city of roughly 6 million residents, the need for adequate representation and respect for diversity is paramount. The challenges faced by Addis Ababa reflect broader issues of governance, identity and democracy in Ethiopia. As the nation continues to navigate a complex path toward progress and unity,
The manner in which Addis Ababa addresses these challenges will undoubtedly play a crucial role in shaping its future and the future of the nation as a whole. Furthermore, the authority of the Addis Ababa police force appears to be limited, while Oromia's police and security agencies operate with impunity, leaving Addis Ababa residents living in fear. Experts who have devoted years to the study of the Amhara ethnic group in Ethiopia consistently note that the Amhara people possess an inherent commitment to abiding by the law and hold a profound respect for governance and authority. It requires significant grievances to motivate them to consider armed resistance against the government. Their enduring values emphasize the paramount importance of unity beyond ethnic divisions, highlighting the collective welfare and the pursuit of a peaceful and united Ethiopia, guided by principles of equality, fairness and justice for all. The armed resistance movement led by Fano against the Abiy government represents a profound yearning for justice, equality, the rule of law and the fundamental right to live in dignity, a desire deeply ingrained in the collective consciousness of the Amhara people. Amharas from all walks of life, including farmers, teachers, students, engineers, doctors, nurses, Muslims, Christians, have come together to stand up and face aggression. They are united by a common aspiration for a better future and a shared commitment to protecting their communities from harm. To truly grasp the essence of the Fano movement and the intricate realities underpinning this complex situation, the international community must transcend superficial narratives. Undertaking thorough investigations to gain a deeper understanding of the complex dynamics at play is imperative. The Western media and the international community share a collective responsibility to demonstrate profound respect and understanding towards the 50 million Amhara people as they seek equality, justice and the fundamental right to live in human dignity. Acknowledging the gravity of this pursuit goes beyond its mere significance. It is, without a doubt, indispensable. This endeavor holds a central role in advancing peace and stability across the East African region.